Um, so you're going to have to be doing a lot of tempo work, zone 3 material, possibly at sweet spot, and to be able to come up and down a bit more, obviously, to the course. Um, excuse me. Specific core and strength routines, um, yeah, again, a crucial factor. Um, nowadays, the, the aero bikes are, you know, so low at the front end. You've got to get really tucked in. Uh, and all of this puts a massive stress and strain. And again, particularly at the longer distances, 10 and 25, most people can suffer through for, you know, 20 minutes in a, in a very aggressive position or in a 25, you know, 50 minutes. Um, yeah, so, Steve, yeah. is that... Uh, you no, know, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, variances for different types of training. I think, obviously, the standard 8 to 20 minute sort of efforts at or just below your threshold is probably one that most people would have heard of and the most typical one that a lot of people do. Um, but what a lot of people sort of fail to understand or fail to look at is using specific cadence drills. Uh, as Colin has, has um, said there, that your ability to ride at a specific effort at a specific cadence is really crucial and building that up at lower intensities before you get to do them, uh, you know, an optimal cadence be it 95 RPM as Con said or maybe 100 RPM, and you've got to be able to do that at lower intensities before starting to do it at higher intensities. And that is something that can take some people maybe three months to learn how to do or six months, you know, and again it's very difficult to, uh, to just switch that overnight, but it's something that again turbo trainers, certainly rowers is a real good tool, teaching your body how to, how to produce an effort at a, at a good constant cadence getting that rhythm as well, being able to get that rhythm and certainly um, building that, uh, that core as well on the bike is really strategic. Um, spending time in an air position, as Colin said, if you fail to do the training on, in the position that you're going to be racing in, you're going to have problems come race day. So again, it's one of these things that you have to sort of gradually build into. I've seen a few guys in the past, you know, maybe starting the time trial season and uh, they jump on their time trial bike a week before the first time trial and then they're into a 25 miler and they want to know why they're very stiff and sore and come out with injuries after. You know, you've got to get your body adapted to it. Um, you know, we're not a machine and we really got to take care of ourselves in that way. And the last bit there on um, targeted efforts above and below threshold, it's exactly what Con says. Whenever we're on the rolling circuits, we're, when we're not on really drag strips that you know requires us to go up and down over our threshold and under our threshold, we have got to be able to do them efforts without having a lot of um, residual fatigue coming from it. And again, it's uh, it's something that we really need to need to look at and something that you need to uh, to focus on and, and really teach your body. And actually, doing a lot of them efforts above and below threshold actually has a good effect on your flat line threshold effort. So we're talking about maybe one, two minutes above your, your threshold going into zone five or even zone six for um, even 30 seconds to maybe two minutes, three minutes, then backing off, coming back down, going back over so we're teaching your body how to really accumulate lots of lactate. Then we're forcing it to try and clear it and really trying to utilize it as well as possible, then go, going back over it. And that's something that you probably won't do in the time trials, but well, it's a really good way to, to boost that um, your flatline lactate threshold. Um, a wee bit on, on cardiac drift, just to expand on that. Whenever I mean about reducing cardiac drift, it is the whenever we're looking at heart rate, and it's a great tool now. Parameters is a really, I mean, to be honest with you, sometimes it, it's it's when I say it's like cheating, it's, it's so easy to do your pacing strategy if you have the accumulation of data before it. It's really good to see, but when we're looking at a pacing strategy and we're holding what I would say a flat line effort, so say we're holding a, an effort between 290 and 300 watts and your heart rate fails to really spike a lot coming in, can be very good if you're keeping producing that power. So whenever we see somebody that their heart starts to, maybe in the first five minutes they're in around 165, 175, the same power, but after 15, 20 minutes, that heart rate is actually 180, 185. That's a large drift, an upward drift of the heart. So the heart is working harder uh, for sustaining that power, that same power, as what it was at the start. 
And a real good way to see progression, what we do with our, our clients, is looking at their ability to maintain that power, but their heart rate isn't starting to raise so high. And we'll talk a wee bit about the, the longer intensities, uh, the longer time trial um, disciplines, where that's even more crucial, you know, because we you don't want to be putting, um, again, a whole lot of strain on your heart. You want your heart to be reacting very smoothly to the effort. And obviously, the more your cardiac drift is, uh, you know, there's a certain ceiling that your, your heart can go to, and, uh, and then you're going to see the red lights coming on. But again, that's really where cardiac drift comes into it. So something to work on, and something that, that increased base fitness, what Colin said, that pyramid fitness and starting to build that up is the foundations of keeping that cardiac drift down later on in, the, in, the, uh, in your preparation. So, Okay, so just uh, going on to warm-up routines. Um, different riders respond uh, differently, so each people are, are very different. Um, so your aim is to activate your aerobic system and, and increasing your, your core temperature. Shorter and more intensive the time trial, the longer the warm-up. Uh, typical warm-up is lasting between 20 to 40 minutes. Again, uh, probably going to the upper scale of that, even though some of the guys, you know, the Tour de France prologues or some of the bigger fashion races are warming up for well over an hour for maybe a real explosive three, four kilometre. Colin might explain a wee bit on his, on his warm-up routines for uh, the, the pursuit. I'm sure it's a lot more intensive. Building intensely, gradually over a period of time, you know, you want to slightly... Uh, you know, aerobic strain, so you want to make sure you're, you're putting a wee bit of strain on your aerobic system. Short, sharp neuromuscular efforts. And a main warm-up session should finish approximately 8 to 10 minutes prior to start. You know, give yourself a wee bit of time to get organized, maybe change your kit, maybe get your uh, hydration right at the start. You know, it's better to be more organized and less stressed hitting the start than, you know, having a longer warm-up routine. And keep well hydrated and, uh, and organized. Colin, I would maybe let you expand a wee bit. We'll have a wee table on the next one, So, um, but if you want to maybe expand a wee bit on them routines, Colin. Yeah, absolutely, Steve. Um, there's a couple of different warm-ups I give to my riders. Um, one is through British Cycling. Um, that can be found on their website, which is now up. Um, it's pretty simplistic, um, but very effective. Um, it relies on your cadence first and foremost, so you move up through in a couple of minutes you're up to 95 and then you just build, build, build. You get to about a minute 30 of really quite intense pedaling. Um, remember with these you don't want to tax the system, you don't want to put yourself in sort of lactate straight away so keep gears relatively low. I wouldn't do these on race gears. Um, so you've got to be able to sustain the cadence. Um, yeah, as I say, that <clears throat> that's the BC workout. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, personally, I prefer uh, a longer warm-up routine, um, um, but tailor it for for what you're riding. Um, you know, the the whole idea, the premise behind warming up is to get you up to that threshold slightly beyond, because once you hit the line, you have to be 100%. And that eight to ten minute window is absolutely perfect. Um, mm -hmm. If you can get it shorter, great, but it's, it, it sometimes is you know, pretty difficult to get to, say, the start of an event from, let's say, the clubhouse or um, the car, wherever you're, wherever you're set up. You know, in an ideal world when uh, Team Sky or Team Cobb or whoever it is set up their vans and have the guys out on the turbo trainers or the rollers, you know, they literally only have three, four minutes to get to the start ramp. Um, that's an ideal world. We don't have that if we're riding a 10 or a 25 or something else. Um, often there's a, a five to ten minute ride to the start. Um, so you can't exactly leave your car and turbo trainer in a, a lay-by at the side of the A5 or wherever. So, you know, be, be prepared to be flexible with your warm-up. But 10, 15 minutes allows you enough time. Um, my my ideal warm up is um, 25 to 30 minutes, um, five minutes at zone one, zone two, at 80 to 90 RPM. That that really is just ticking your legs over. 
Um, and then you just gradually pick it up five minutes at zone three and four at 90 to 100. So you've gone up not only at power zone, you've gone up RPMs as well. I like five minutes at threshold, that really gets me going. Um, I come back down just at tempo, about zone three, 90 to 100 RPM again. And then, <coughs> excuse me, then three, five to eight second, very, very explosive efforts on a small gear, 120 to 150 RPM. Uh, cruise between it, bring the heart rate back down, breathe. Don't forget to breathe while you're doing these warm-up routines. Uh, it sounds silly, but people do. You breathe shallow, you don't get the oxygen around the system, so breathe deep, slow your heart rate down a bit. Then I get back up to zone three, finish off with a nice steady five minutes, thinking things through, 90 to 100 RPM, and then cool it off, cruise down, zone one. Now some people prefer to cut this out, the last little zone one part, it's, you know, it's just personal preference. Um, as, as mentioned, you know, 10 minutes behind the, the warm-up is ideal. Um, a few little handy hints. Um, unless you've got a helper, ensure everything is ready before you start the warm-up. It's nothing is worse than getting off the rollers, getting off the turbo. You're hun you know, you, you, you're warmed up perfectly, and then you have to fiddle around, changing your wheels, finding your crash hat. Oh, I didn't fill my bottle up. Oh, I didn't do this. Well, that's inexcusable. You've got to be focused. You've got to be organised. Have your race wheels prepared, your helmet ready, visor cleaned. Um, make sure the, the you know the race bike is ready to go. I I prefer to warm up on my road bike just with a pair of training wheels in and have my TT bike 100% done. As Steve mentioned, hydrate whilst you're warming up. It's absolutely crucial. So many people forget to do it because you're in that zone, you're warming up, and you're just, you know, focusing, focusing. Part of the focus should be keep yourself hydrated. Um, small sips often just keep fueling the system. Um, <laughs> sounds silly, but uh, remember that what goes in often has to come out. So allow yourself just that uh, that window to find uh, a bush or a tree or a toilet uh, or an emergency use of beat on. Uh, just chuck it away afterwards. Um, so, yeah, I think pretty much that covers that, Steve. If you want to move on, yeah, that, mate. Um, I think the, your 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 whole event, your whole race, can be won and lost in the tank drop. You know, you could do all the you know weeks or months of preparation, and something as crucial as the warm up and not getting it right, uh, as as Connor said not being organized, being stressed, coming into it, um, you know, them simple things can really, you know, uh, have a detrimental effect to your performance in the day and really ruin a lot of that hard work that's put in in the weeks and months leading up to your event. I think it's just crucial that we activate our systems that we're going to be using during the race. So if it's a shorter, sharper, more intensive time trial, stroke prologue type effort, we're obviously trying to activate them sort of neuromuscular systems trying to get them pathways firing, trying to get that nervous system open and get the receptors going into our brains that, okay, these are the systems we're going to be using very intensely in another 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Or we're looking at, obviously, standard warm-up like this, maybe towards a 10 or 25, where we're trying to sort of build up our gradual intensities, as Colin said, ramping it up slightly over, you know, five minutes, maybe eight minutes, and then doing some short, sharp, maybe higher cadence intensities or, you know, five to ten seconds. Nothing that's going to put a lot of muscular strain, but we're just looking at, again, building our um, aerobic system slightly and also looking at uh, putting a wee bit of strain on our, on our nervous system, neuromuscular system, to make sure that that memory is there. But again, the warm-up routine certainly is something that uh, you should take very seriously and, and, uh, and practice and even practice this routine in some of your training sessions. I think it's a great way to even get used to it, calm, you know, maybe adding it into a warm-up session into your time trial or your, your uh, training session, maybe you're doing a travel train or something, just to get used to that, uh, used to get used to that living, so. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so next. Stephen, sorry, can I, can we just go back? Yep. Cool. Well worth mentioning that um, the warm up, the race, warm down, absolutely crucial. Um, gone are the days of, of just getting off the bike, packing it in the car, handing in your number, getting your free cup of tea. Um, a warm down is a must. Okay? It's going to take you 10 or 15 minutes. Um, again, if you're organized, if you do have a helper, that's fantastic because they can set your rollers up afterwards or your turbo. But just again, this comes back to organization um, and giving yourself every opportunity to do the best you can. You warm down, um, yeah, off the bike, over the line, back to the car, back to the HQ, wherever you are. Um, get the bike on the rollers, on the on the turbo, spin your legs. Uh, 10 to 15 minutes, even at an unstructured ride, just at 10 to 15 minutes is absolutely brilliant. Just spins it out, helps the flushing of lactate and the metabolites, just, just flushes it through, it just aids recovery. Um, my, my personal warm-up, I, I throw in a couple of high RPM um, spin-outs, very low gears, um, and then back it off. So I, I, I normally do a 15 to 20 minute warm-down, um, depends. Um, but it's the perfect time to do what I call a post-race review mentally. Um, it's also a good time you can sit there, just get your recovery product into you. Um, but just think of think of things. Uh, we'll go into this in a bit more detail in a bit um, about the actual sort of mental preparation. But one thing that is crucial is a post-race review. Steve, that's that's pretty much on. Yeah. Warm down. Man. Okay, so we're going on to um, courses, parkours, I suppose the more European terminology for it. So uh, we're looking at each course will have its own uh, peculiarities and environments. It's very important to, to know as much as you can about this in advance. I think for people that maybe do regular time trials, uh, maybe weekly time trials on the same circuits, maybe every Wednesday night there's a time trial or uh, every Thursday night or midweek, or weekends, you know, you start to learn your 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 road, and you start to learn maybe what way the wind direction normally is. There's going to be times when you're going to uh, a completely alien course, and maybe it's some national championships or regional championships, and you know you don't let don't let that familiarity slip. So you really do got to try and put your homework in. So you know it's not always possible, as I say here, to to ride the course, um, you know. But if you can try and look at it as much as possible. You know, it's a simple thing as even going on to, we use modern technology like Google Maps, Google Earth, trying to see some wee bits and pieces. Maybe if you feel it's a very twisting course or a very technical course, you know, again, some of the technology out there is really great that you can try and visualize things as much as possible and try and see it. Every little bit helps, especially when you're looking at roundabouts, corners, road surface, traffic. You're trying to get as much of that information as possible before you start is uh, again the difference between winning and coming third or losing three or four seconds in each corner or each roundabout and if there's you know ten corners and ten roundabouts and you lose two or three seconds on on each one you know there's uh, 40 seconds to over a minute gone just because of your maybe lack of knowledge and what you could have done in your in your homework sort of leading up to it. Colin I'm sure you have a lot of experience with courses and parkours and maybe not looking, paying attention to the things. Yeah, I mean, it's to be honest with you, um, it has cost me. Um, I wouldn't say uh, many races, but it has. Uh, one example, um, I rode a, a professional race in France called the uh, Poitou Chiron, um, and I, I had points jersey. I'd come second in the prologue. Um, I was up there on a couple of st road stages. Um, and the time trial I was really looking forward to, I had great form. Um, and I sort of, yeah, I'd, I'd given myself every opportunity for the win. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to like, the course beforehand. Um, and I hesitated going through a roundabout, whereas the guy that won it, uh, a French rider called Eddie Seigneur, he was a pretty local rider, uh, and he knew this particular roundabout. Um, and 
obviously the, the roads there. And it just goes to show he beat me by less than a second. And my hesitation at that roundabout and having to kick out of it, uh, mess around with my gears, you know, that could have cost, well, it did cost me. Um, so get out there if you can. Try to do as much research about the course you're riding, uh, the circuit, whatever you can. Um, you know, it, it's there in front of you. Every course you ride is slightly different, and each week, if you ride the same course, uh, there's different different environmental factors. You know, there's different weather, different climate. All these things uh, are going to play a massive, massive part. So the more you can do, um, you know, in the in the background, in in the lead up to the event, particularly if you're going to target say a PB or you're, you're targeting a course PB, a power B, PB, uh, a national title, whatever, you know, it's absolutely crucial to get out there, ride the course. Driving over it is, is great. As Steve said, you know, get on Google Earth, get on Google Maps, whatever you can, check things out. But there's nothing better than being able to ride the course. Obviously, in, in the UK, um, you could be very careful if you're, you know, warming up on the circuit. A lot of organisers don't want, like you to do that. Um, so, yeah, again, it's it's all down to research. If you can get out there the week or a couple of days before, um, just do it. Um, picking up on what Steve was saying there about roundabouts, corners, road surfaces, um, all these things come into play, and, and this is all part of your the research that you do, you know, how, you know, how is the roundabout, am I going to be able to, you know, attack it pretty fast, is it definitely going to be, you know, sort of uh, off camber, uh, corners again, you know, how fast can you go through a corner, am I going to come off the aero bars, well, these things, road surfaces, um, I know the National uh, 10 this year is on a course called Woolby. Um, which is one of my local courses. Um, did most of my motor pacing training up there. I do my two by twenties. I do my all my base work uh, on my TT bike up there. So I know it like the back of my hand. I know certain sectors are smooth, certain are rough. I know where to put the power down, when to come off it, how to go around the roundabout. And that's just through riding it time and time again, research, research, research. Um, one thing that um, you won't get in obviously prologues and uh, a lot of closed road uh, races of traffic. Yeah, sure, you get following cars and you get a motorcycle out rider. But on UK roads, uh, traffic, um, you're going to get drag. Let's put it that way. Yes, it can have the you know alternate effect if you've got a string of traffic coming the other way and nothing coming past you. But use it to your advantage when possible. Um, Obviously, safety is paramount. Don't sort of ride right out by the white line. But um, you know, the, the classic example was someone like Alf Engers being able to ride, you know, almost in the middle of the carriageway, so traffic had to go round him, give him a drag. All these things, small factors. You know, it's like Sky, it's like Bracefield, and all these guys say, you know, these these minimal factors all add up. So your marginal gains. Traffic is definitely one of them, so use it to your advantage. Okay, um, we're going to move on to, uh, to, to go through. Our next bit is on pacing strategies. So uh, I think again, it's one of the big things that, that we work with, uh, certainly with our clients. Um, we're using a lot of the information that we've built up through coaching, through training, through looking at data, uh, through looking at previous racing history. And building that into some sort of strategy that we can put towards our athletes on the day, on race day, or certainly going into um, you know big events and whatnot. Sometimes it's uh, it's hit and miss, and sometimes you're you're learning as it goes along. You can't always get it right, but there's a few things that each person can can look at. So very basic, very uh, common uh, mistake is going way over your threshold too early at the start. I have done that many times myself, and you know you're feeling good. You get off the start ramp, and the blood's pumping. That first uh, two or three minutes uh, feels like a sprint, or you're going into a pursuit type effort, 
even though it might be, you know, a 25 mile time trial, and all of a sudden then the, the red lights start flashing off the four or five mile, and, uh, you know, you can't really recover. So you want to really avoid doing that. You know, if you're using heart rate, um, just let that, because it's harder to gauge that maybe when you're using heart rate, because obviously there's lag in your heart rate whenever you're starting. So you want to make sure that you're building your heart rate up gradually to what you believe to be your threshold heart rate, maybe over three to four minutes. Some people's rise quicker than others, but you know, if you're starting to get to your threshold heart rate after a minute, then I would probably say you've started too hard. You know, you because your heart rate should take a wee bit of time to build up, even if your power is at that level, you know, your your heart rate is gonna lag behind. Um cutting your race down into chunks, five, ten minute blocks, especially for the longer efforts. Sometimes focusing too far ahead can crack you a little bit. So cutting that down into chunks is a really good way of visualization of your effort, and really focusing on a short period of time. Avoid prolonged periods over under your set power effort. It comes down to, again, your knowledge and knowing what you can sustain and the effort that you can do. So we don't want to see big spikes um, at the start and then going way under your, your threshold for you know five or ten minutes, then going back up or above your effort and back down, that's not going to, uh, even though your average may be the same then, it's not going to be um, very cohesive whenever we're looking at a, a constant power and also getting, squeezing out every bit of energy that you have. And certainly your time will reflect uh, having a constant effort is going to reflect a lot better. Um, 10 mile time trials can be done probably in around, I mean, a lot of guys that, that I know are doing their 10 mile time trial, which is between 20 minutes and 25 minutes and around 105 to 110 percent of their FTP power. So again, some riders vary is different. So maybe some of the riders that have a better, a better uh, anaerobic power can maybe hit certainly 110, maybe a little bit more for their 10 mile time trial power. But whenever it comes to 25, you know, doing the longer efforts, they're a little less um, their ability to, to to sit at maybe a solid FTP effort isn't as good and they're lagging behind and falling down on that. But generally you're looking at maybe 105, 110% um, guys hitting their, their FTP, of their FTP. Uh, not, that's not your average for a 20 minute power, so your FTP, we usually subtract 5% off that, so that's the number that I'm, I'm kind of using that. 25 mile time trial, really uh, your FTP generally is what you would probably sustain for a 25 mile time trial effort. If you are using a power meter, and you find that you do a 25 mile time trial and your power is 10 watts or 15 watts above your FTP, then I would say your FTP has changed. So I would certainly go and reevaluate your, your power zones. Okay. Um, heart rate, uh, heart rates between 10 and 25 mile can have little difference. Again, it's very common that what we see that your average may have been a 10 mile time trial and your average in a 25 mile time trial mightn't change a whole lot. It could only be two or three bits, even though if you have a power meter, it could be within maybe 20 watts or something like that. But um, again, your heart is very much more of a, more of a gray area. Um, and don't save too much for your last section. Get the majority of effort out on the road. Again, what I've seen and certainly see a lot of guys early in the season, in their time trial season, um, again, we're starting to look at pacing strategies and maybe not getting it right right in the first couple of weeks, we're seeing that they're really having a lot of power left in that, in that last two or three minutes. And yes, I always say squeeze as much out that you can, but whenever I see somebody hurting out 50 watts more for the last two miles, you know, then I say, okay, well, we should really be pacing it a little bit higher in that past eight miles. You know, so I'd rather you only be able to squeeze maybe 20 watts more uh, in the last two miles, but have a higher average in the uh, in the main meat of the of the time trial before it, so it's just a case of working on that, and uh, probably over time you start to hone that in. But certainly don't leave it that you're having a lot left. And sometimes I see guys and they're sprinting across the line that they could beat Cavendish, and I think to myself, well, you know, if you can do that, you have one hard enough. You know, and usually if you can sustain a better effort during it, you'll, your time will be reflected. Uh, Colin, I'm sure you have some advice on, on pacing strategies and some do's and don'ts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you covered it very, very well there indeed. Um, and I've got to say, possibly pacing strategies is, is the single hardest factor 
to teach anybody in time trialing. It really is. Um, and you're going to you're gonna hate me for saying it, but there is only one way of doing this, and that is just repetition. Lots and lots of repetitive efforts at a specified heart rate, power, and just using those zones and getting to know your body, getting to know how hard you can push yourself and hold that pace and hold that threshold. Um, you, you literally are just going to have to do it. And this, this relates back to what we were saying earlier about training. You know, it's that base, you get that in, and then you use your zones. And when you get up to that threshold zone, you know, the more you've done to get to that with everything else done properly, the easier it is to pace yourself. Yeah, pacing is going to get, you know, variance in there with um, wind, uh, road surface, aerodynamics, um, you name it. But deep down, it is just down to the rider, down to you knowing yourself. Um, as Steve said, one of the worst things is just going out too hard. Um, lapse back into anecdote, a couple of things to put it into perspective. Um, my first ever prologue as a professional rider was in Paris Nice. Warmed up brilliantly. I had for the time, you know, the bike, the disc wheel, everything. It was quite a technical course which suited me down to the ground. I went off the line like it was a kilometer time trial on the track. I went ballistic. At halfway I was leading. By the finish, I was 17th because I'd gone into the red, hit the last climb, and I just I could not drive it home for the last couple of k's. I completely thrashed myself. Um, I saw somebody. Uh, I was doing a CP20 test recently, um, and I was doing it with a, a, another rider. And he started off, and after two or three minutes, he was doing 455 watts, and I'm thinking, there's no way. It's and he was riding away from me. Sure enough, after 10 minutes, he started coming back. After 15 minutes, we were together. After 20 minutes, he was maybe two, 300 yards behind. Um, you've got to let your body and your system build up gradually. Don't go out. Yeah, fine, if it is a kilometre time trial you're doing, magic. You know what, there are prologues out there that are only two, three kilometres. Well, yeah, you probably can just go out the gate like a rocket. But 90% of the time, we're looking at around about the 15, 16 kilometre time trial, the 10 mile, the 25. If you go into the red too soon, that's it. Very um, rarely. To even... Sorry, Colin. Maybe sorry, what about um, hills and wind? What's you know your thought on going into uh, maybe the headwind start? Say you know it's a five out and a five back. Uh, it's a headwind out and a tailwind back. What's your, your thoughts on, obviously, pacing for the wind and the environmental? I think it depends also um, very much on the rider. Um, I found that I drive into the wind, um, drive you know, quite heavily into a uh, headwind. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bulkier rider, and the bulkier riders can do that. Um, but they can also use the tailwind to advantage. Um, I know slightly different, but I'll, I'll put it into perspective on an outdoor drive. My strength was the fact that I could just drive it through the headwind in the back straight and recover with the tailwind. You can do the same with a time trial. So if you absolutely flatter yourself going into a headwind, you can actually, sounds silly, but you can actually recover at a very high pace with a tailwind. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, having a tailwind, you, you are going to wash off a few watts of power anyway. Um, so if you are riding to power, you, you, you do have to factor that in. Uh, with hills, again, it's a case of not going into the red. Unless, unless you know your system and your body well enough to know that you can go into the red maybe three or four times in an event that's got, say, six hills, well, obviously don't go into red on six times, only go up, you know, three or four. Um, yeah, I think 
I think that, that, that goes back to maybe the training that we're saying that, you know, it's very important to have your training that you're able to go over and above your threshold. And whenever you've got a hilly circuit that, okay, you can slightly go, put a little bit more power down on, on the climb and back off. Obviously, it's easier to put power down going up a hill. Uh, you're going against gravity than coming down. But again, it's, it's very important that we, um, you know, are trained enough to do it. You know, if you don't have enough training, your ability to go over and above your threshold, uh, I think you're you're going to um, you're going to suffer there. So, uh, so I think we'll we'll have a chance, obviously, to answer ask more questions at the end. I think we've still quite a quite a bit to go through. Um, okay, so nutrition, big area topic. Um, we've done quite individual seminars and webinars on on nutrition, but um, some of the basics here of of really what I see people doing wrong and doing right. Uh, keep them well hydrated, certainly at least in the three hours leading up to an event. If you've got a time trial in the evening, make sure you're keeping well hydrated during the day. Don't wait until an hour before the race and consume you know one or two liters of liquid just to get hydrated. You don't want that bloated uh, feeling full of stomach. You know, consume a copper rich meal three to four hours prior to start. Um, you know, eighty to to hundred grams. That's if you're maybe doing some of that, maybe some of the longer events. So you want to try and again for those guys and girls that are on work and you've got an evening start. You know, try and organise uh, quite a good carbohydrate uh, meal. Maybe instead of having your lighter lunch or whatnot, you know, maybe try and consume a little bit more of a higher carbohydrate intake. Lighter snacks maybe consumed. Uh, you know, two hours from the start. If you are doing maybe a shorter event and you don't need as much. Uh, you know, glycogen in your body for it, and that lighter snack again has to be very easily digestible. Avoiding a lot of fiber, avoiding a lot of fat. You would don't want uh, gastro problems leading into it. Um, using an isotonic uh, carbo drink to sip in the hour leading up to the event. So again, you know, you want to be sipping away at certainly sort of isotonic drinks going in. Um, caffeine to be consumed uh, one hour to forty-five minutes before the start time. For those of you that use caffeine. Uh, I've seen a lot of people consuming caffeine, be it a coffee or a caffeinated gel or something like that. Uh, you know, on the start line, well, you're going to get the benefit. You're going to get the benefit of that really whenever you're you're uh, probably finished the race. So you know, you want to make sure that you're getting that caffeine in you at least an hour before the start. Um, easily digestible sugar um, taken. You know, if you do feel you need a boost, maybe you haven't eaten enough, or maybe you feel that okay, I faded a wee bit. Those of you that like taking gels, although it can play a little bit of havoc with your stomach, and uh, you know, be warned of that. Um, maybe 20 minutes before the start. Uh, again, I wouldn't really get too much into. Um, I wouldn't really get too much into taking a lot of high sugary content things in the start line. You want to make sure that you probably have enough, you know, calories consumed before that. But if you do feel you need something, then you know, take it maybe 20 minutes before the start. Um, and then making sure they're starting the event with you know, your food fully digested, again, avoid that bloated feeling. Uh, nitrate loading, a lot of new sands out there about beet, uh, beet juice, so I think it's probably full of the rage now. I know there's a very um, good sand, a lot of positive sands behind it. I'm starting to see a lot of the top teams and top riders in the world uh, consu consuming sort of beet juice uh, you know, in the hour or so before it. I know they even load on it maybe in the morning as well. Probably comes down to uh, trial and error for different people, uh, and also the phosphates, uh, Zebid, Max, Basic, but again, your phosphate load and trying to, to use that uh, lactate buffering and trying to really get that edge on it. So again, phosphates is something that uh, I would say is completely personal and how people load on it, if it works and it doesn't work. I've seen positives and negatives from different athletes, from very experienced athletes that have had adverse effects. You know. Again, it can be a mental thing, or it cannot be. But uh, again, it's something that you really need to you need to do personally and, and try and look at. Uh, the don'ts certainly do not slip in your hydration. In the hours leading up the event, Colin made a very strong point saying about your warm up routine. Do not let yourself get dehydrated. Make sure you have your hydration set out and organised for it. Again, you can be well hydrated for all day in the hour leading up to your to your event. You're on the turbo trainer. You don't have your bottle near you. You do 20 minutes. Uh, you start the time trial with a dry mouth. That's not what you want to be doing. You want to make sure, even using a wee mouth rinse, 
carbohydrate nitrants, spitting it out, just getting that moisture into your mouth is also a real positive thing, but you don't want to let that slip. Avoid consuming large amounts of liquid in the hour leading up to it. Again, I've hit on that. Reducing your fiber fat intake, pre-event meal. You know, we want to make sure that we're taking very good um, uh, carbohydrate rich food that is easily absorbed and digested. Again, something that's personal to you. Uh, don't take caffeine again, like I said, on that post the start. Um, and you know, avoid the avoid the requirement to consume sugar during the, the time trial distance dependent. So you don't want to be feeling that you need to take uh, food or consume calories in a 10 mile time trial. You, know, you want to make sure that you have enough glycogen in your body and you should do unless you've done something really wrong to be able to get a sustained hard maximum effort for you know between 20 to 45 minutes really without having to consume um, you know a carbohydrate rich snack uh, and don't eat any solids really in the 30 to 45 minutes leading up to the start. Again you want to make sure that anything you are taking is of uh, you know liquid form or gel form or something like that. Uh, Colin is there anything that you feel you want to add to that? Um, no I think if you've pretty much covered everything there Steve. One, one thing I will just um, let everybody know is that um, without sounding a new age and hippie, the supplements uh, and, and sort of pre-made food and drink are, are all well and good, but don't forget that you know your body craves natural product, craves natural foods and fluids. So you know make sure that you know leading up that a piece of fruit is is you know just as good as uh, a gel every now and then. Um, obviously you can't shove a, an apple up your trouser leg you know in a 25 uh, whereas you can a gel but um, the more natural product you can you can feed the body uh, better. Um, I for shorter time trials 10s and 25s um, yeah you know just just yeah, like uh, Graham O'Brien with you know jam sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches, <laughs> absolutely fine. You know, it sounds dopey, but you know he's getting the carbohydrates, both simple and complex, in there. Um, but hydration for me uh, is 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 primary. Um, everybody eats breakfast. Well, not everybody eats breakfast. Sorry, that's a generalisation. But you should eat breakfast. You should eat a, a you know pre-race meal. Um, for a shorter event, you really don't need to sit down to a massive plate of pasta or rice and chicken. Um, again, I hop back to when I turned professional. You know, you turn up at a, a stage race in France, and um, you know you were expected three hours before the stage start to have finished a massive plate of rice and pasta and steak, chicken, and things like this. And I'd probably say 75% of the time it wasn't digested by the time you hit the start line. The first two hours of a race, let alone a time trial, you know, it's sitting heavy in your gut. Um, the digestion is taking blood away from where it needs to be around the body. So eat lighter um, and break it up again. You know, just little things, snack. You know, just keep feeding, just drip feed the body pretty much. Um, Going on to things like the nitrate loading, uh, phosphates, ketones, beta alanine, um, be be careful with these things. You know, uh, read up on them, do your research. Um, you put in, you know, you put in chemicals and you put in products into your body. Get advice from your doctor, uh, but don't be afraid to experiment. Um, maybe in club tens, maybe in training. Um, maybe don't uh, go and do it for a national title or something like that. Um, I know last year I started, um, I've always used beetroot juice uh, in its natural form. Um, phosphates, uh, I have tried in the past and I thought I'd give them a go last year. I used them for three events. Uh, I had great results in one and quite frankly the other two I couldn't have told you if it made any difference or not. Um, I've just started using a product that's got beta alanine in it. Uh, I am getting good results with that. Um, it leaves you a bit tingly, which is uh, a bit of a weird sensation. But you know, this is the time. I'm not racing at the moment due to an injury, but this is the time now that 
I'm experimenting with things, I'm trying things out so that later in my racing season I'm not going to come up against something that I'm not really sure of. Um, very, very important, um, as Steve says, you know, don't eat solids in the 35 to 45 minutes leading up to the start. They will sit heavy in your gut. Um, and if you've got a propensity to throwing up, you know, yeah, it's going to come up bad. So liquid, you know, less solid food. Um, one thing that I don't have a great deal of experience with, and I'll freely admit that, is the longer distance stuff. The longest time trial I rode was about 75, 80 kilometers, which is the Grand Prix Eddy Mertz in Belgium. Um, so I've never ridden 100. Uh, I've certainly never ridden 10, you know, 12 hour, whatever, um, 24s. Um, those you obviously need, you know, a fair bit of nutrition, a fair bit of glucose coming in, carbs. You're going to have to get the proteins in early. Um, we do dig deep do have our own nutritionists, so for those people that really want some more focused advice on nutrition, I'd certainly recommend having a word with um, Rob. He's a Dutch guy, Rob van der Verf. He works with uh, Giant Alpacin as well as Dick Deep, uh, and he's far better qualified to speak about nutrition than I am. So, you know, let us know if you need any information on that. Steve? Yeah. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, I think that you know nutrition is, is a massive topic in itself, and as Colin says, it really is down to uh, your own personal choice and, and trial and error. And that's what I will say about a lot of them. A lot of them supplements, a lot of them nutrition is test them in training, test them whatever non-competition that Colin's doing right now, so you have it whenever we're, um, you have it honed in whenever you're at a bent day. So okay, we're going to go through a bit of aerodynamics and equipment. I know we're going to maybe go over time a wee bit, but I hope that you all appreciate the amount of information that we're we're providing here and the ability to to get as much in here as possible, so you can all learn. So this is a a wee snapshot, um, and this is taken from aerosportsresearch.com. You can go check it out. They, they do a lot of um, research in aerodynamics across lots of different sports, and you know, work with a lot of different writers. So this maybe gives you, this is actually taken from research uh, over maybe over a year of uh, riders' ability to save time. And this is done in a 25 mile, uh, 40 kilometer time trial effort and looking at times in around the 50 minute mark. So, okay, obviously very few people are, are hitting 50 minute mark, but this is the times that they find could be saved uh, from changing um, these individual uh, items within that person whenever they're going for uh, an effort in around 50 minutes or 25 miles, 40 kilometers. So you're looking at a narrow helmet, obviously you had a lot of gains, um, you know, getting a proper aero helmet. And I know aero helmets are now, you know, certainly there's that many of them on the market, but even though there's a lot of research on the type of aero helmet fits for a different person, unfortunately you probably need to go to uh, you know, wind tunnel testing or whatnot to get that done. Time trial suit, skin suit. 134 seconds for those of you that don't have skin suits. They're probably pretty common amongst uh, most time trials. You know, certainly have a big gains instead of a, a flopping jersey and shorts. Wind tunnel positioning, 56 seconds. Probably something that the majority of us here could never uh, have the ability to do. But certainly whenever I think the professionals, whenever they exhaust every bit of clothing, every bit of equipment, it's probably the icing on the cake. Aero bars, 122 seconds. That's really probably the most cost-effective item that you could get. So for those of you that maybe don't have a time trial bike, you may be new to time trials, you've got a road bike, find yourself a good set of aero bars. You can pick them up from, you know, maybe 50 to 100 pounds. Um, Clip-on bars, that is, you know, is really good savings on your on your bank for your buck, as they say. So the amount of savings that you can get. Aero frame, 17 seconds. Probably a little bit overrated. Maybe a lot of people think it's, it's the be-all and end-all, but again, um, you know, you can look at different things like, like obviously your, your shoe covers uh, and your, what might be quite a revelation for some people is the relevance of the front wheel in comparison to the rear wheel. So how much a priority it is to get the front wheel right and certainly to have a front aero wheel, be it a tri-spoke, four-spoke um, or, you know, maybe a, an 80 uh, or a 110 rim compared to, to the rear wheel. So. A lot of people always focus probably on a disc wheel, but certainly from a lot of research that's out there, 
it is crucial to have an aerodynamic front wheel, if not more crucial, uh, than uh, certainly than a back wheel. So, um, keep in your position, uh, keep in narrow for frontal area drag. You can see here the picture of Bradley Wiggins, probably the you know the best time trialist of his generation, or certainly one of the best time trialists of his generation, current world champion. Uh, obviously, has spent a lot of years honing his position and. A, and if you were to look back at his time trial position from his Cofidis days at La France de Joux, you'll see he's changed quite significantly. One of the biggest areas that has changed is his frontal area, trying to get narrow. So we can see how he is at keeping tucked in, keeping his arrow, uh, his elbows, um, uh, his elbows narrow as well as his, uh, his, his shoulders. Okay, so we're trying to keep that frontal area down. So we're trying to reduce that whole area that's cutting through the wind. Uh, maintaining a, a good hip flexion, maintaining a good position without compromising power. Again, something that you've really got to train at and something you should probably look at in the winter months as you build up towards the season. Trying to produce a power in an aerodynamic position is easier said than done. Uh, so again, tinker with it, look with it, go to a, you know, a professional bike fitter, making sure that you're getting something that's aerodynamic plus powerful plus staying injury free. So we don't want to be in an aerodynamic position, the most air position in the world, but unable to produce the power that we can do, or something that's going to make uh, us injured or imbalance is really something we'll want to try and avoid. Keeping elbows and hands narrow, like I say, getting them close together, making sure that you have, uh, again, that, that tuck and that uh, body all squeezed in, uh, and also keeping your head tucked in. And that was one thing that, that certainly I learned during uh, my professional career was you know, trying to position your head and trying to tuck your head very much almost down into your neck and trying to get uh, as down as possible and almost getting as compact as possible in that frontal area. So whenever you're powering through that wind and powering through them climbs and you're able to really get that power down through the cranks and you're over your bottom bracket, that that bit of an arrow, which is your frontal part of your body cutting through that wind, is as narrow as possible. Um, Colin, is there anything uh, a wee bit on that that you would like to, to hit on? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll run through things pretty quickly. Um, I've got a fair few notes here on, you know, bike choices and equipment. But, um, yeah, if you, you want know, to go through those bits on equipment, so. Yeah, beautiful. You know, aerodynamics, first and foremost, they're going to make a massive, massive difference to you. Um, just remember that it's all purely performance orientated and comfort is a secondary and limiting factor. So for your TTs that are longer, um, maybe consider changing your position slightly to a less aggressive position, a more comfortable position. Again, this comes, you know, linked into what Steve was saying there about stretching and core strength, um, you know, getting your glutes and your hip flexors, you know, right 100% sorted. Um, yeah, the, the use of, of, of tri bars, skis, aero bars, whatever you want to call them, you know, just shrinking of that front area, um, you know, cutting through the air. Even if you've got to clip them onto a road bike, if you haven't yet got a TT bike, can't afford one, just get yourself a pair, get them on. They will make a huge difference. Um, I'll lapse into anecdote again. I can honestly say that not using them at the 1990 World Championships uh, when I was defending Pursuit Champion cost me a medal. Um, I was staunch in my um, opposition to them. I thought that they were uh, a waste of time on the track. Um, yeah, the next year I used them in 91. Uh, I broke a world record. Perfect. So, I, yeah, again, anecdote, but they do work. Wheels, absolutely crucial. As Steve was saying, you know, Look at them as a whole, not just a, a you know sling a disc in and you're going to get you know 100 percent of the uh, benefit. The front wheel does count. That's cutting through the air. Um, use yeah, ideally a tri spoke, a four spoke. Um, I don't think we can use five spokes on the road in the UK. I know uh, in Europe I used one in a few prologues. Uh, they are brilliant. I'm not sure that we're allowed to use them here. Just just check with the uh, CTT. Um, you know, DV. Uh, just remember, you've got to be able to handle these things as well. And in windy conditions, it can get a bit difficult. So, if you've got the budget, 
have as many options as you can. Um, a couple of my friends down in Leicestershire um, have Rautec covers for the rear. This can be clipped onto a deep V. Um, so they've actually got a couple of choices. Uh, if it's a really windy or a hilly course, they just use the deep Vs or they clip on the Rautec over the rear disc. Um, tires and tubs. Um, okay, you've, you've got to look at you know the, the whole dichotomy here of using tubs or clinches. Um, tubs are faster. Uh, they're usually lighter, but they are more expensive. Um, look into rolling resistance, tire pressures as well. Um, you know, and this comes down to what we were saying about the course and the parkour. There's no point in sticking, you know, 160 psi in a Veloflex record on the Woolby circuit at the moment because it is as rough as all hell. Um, you're going to get a very rough ride, and you'll probably punch it. So, you know, again, it comes down to riding the course, looking at your pressures of tyres. Clinches do offer the ease of changing an inner tube very quickly if you puncture in the warm-up or if the tread pattern, you know, you need to change your tyre, you know, event, if it starts to rain at your event. Um, personally, I drive tubs every time. Some fast tyres, if you, if you want to go out and research this, um, and I'm not saying one is better than the other. Um, Veloflex Records do gassed, they do a beautiful silk tyre. Conti Olympics, um, FMB Records, Victoria Chronos, um, and then there's a whole, um, well, there's a whole new world on do I use 20 mil, 23, 25s. You get an example of how things have changed over, over time. Uh, when I rode the Olympics in 88, we were all riding 18 mil tyres. Uh, now, last year, I was, I, was, I was testing on 25s. Um, the width of the rim has changed, obviously, and things sit differently, and there's more aerodynamics involved. Um, one thing that I would really look at carefully, and this goes to your training, this goes to, it goes to the crux of everything, really, is gearing. Um, I was a naturally gifted pedaler. Uh, I had a lot of suplex. I was able to spin a gear really, really well. Uh, my 10 mile record of 1848 was done on 52.13 top and most of the time I was in 52.15, uh, 52, 52.14. Um, however, that doesn't suit everybody, you know, spinning at 120, 130 RPM is not the way to go in a 50 mile time trial, you'll blow up. Um, so look at gearing, a lot of people are running the bigger gears now, I like to ride a 55 because I know I can get in a 55, 15, 55, 14 and I'm really comfortable. I get a lot of torque and I can roll that at 95 RPM. I'm really comfortable and when I really go for the finish, I just drop it down and down and down. Um, so, you know, look at these certain things, ratios, the, the tension on the chain, on a bigger chain ring as well. All of these things, you're going to wash off a few watts if you've got too tight a link and all these things can be looked at. Um, the use of Q-rings or osymmetrics, um, I'm sitting on the fence, uh, I've used both, um, I had better results I have to say with the osymmetrics over Qs, I haven't used QXLs, um, again, it's, it's expensive but the best way is experimentation. Um, I still run Q-rings on my road bike at the moment, uh, if I'm perfectly honest with you, I couldn't tell a blind bit of difference between them and you know, a set of Durace round rings. Um, the helmet, very, very important. As Steve was saying there, you had a little bit picture of uh, Bertie. Um, it's better to wear a helmet than not, aerodynamically speaking, and I suppose safety-wise as well, although I'm not getting into the whole safety thing of paternalism and liber you know, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> whole new game. Long-tailed versus snub-tailed, uh, it depends on the rider's style, it also depends on the on the course. Um, even, an, even an aero road helmet, uh, like a gyro uh, air attack, uh, is going to be you know better than bareheaded. Um, prime example uh, was a teammate of mine that won the 89 uh, Tour de France, Le Monde, you know, rode that last uh, time trial absolutely brilliantly. You know, I had everything there was at that time, the tri bars, the disc wheels, the aero helmet. The one major thing that Fignon didn't 
and probably costing the tour was not so much the you know the bike and all that, but was you had flowing locks, ponytail, it was unaerodynamic. Um, skin suit or speed suit, yeah, massive, massive gains to be had here. It's important to have a very close fitting, not ill fitting clothing. Um, you know, you, you, you're talking about drag, you're pushing yourself through wind, you're pushing yourself through air, so you've got to be as, the, the term is slippy as possible, so try to do that. Um, long sleeve is better than short sleeve unless you shave your arms, and I highly recommend not shaving your arms, because you end up looking like me, like a bear. Um, no pins can adapt to skin suit nowadays so that you can actually tuck your number in and you don't have a number flapping around. How many times have you watched television or gone to a race and you see a rider there with, you know, an eight grand bike, a uh, 200 quid skin suit, a 200 quid helmet and his number's flapping around held on with a couple of safety pins and it's flapping in the breeze. It's ridiculous. You've spent all that money, all that time investing and then you go and allow this thing to wash off what? Get it tucked down. Use sticky tape, double-sided tape, use lots of pins, keep it flush. As I say, there's a company called No Pins now that put a see-through uh, section in the back of your skin suit so your number slips in. It's not expensive. It's a really, really good idea. Um, overshoes, crucial. Um, yep, yeah, fine if you've got a shoe sponsor that uh, wants you to ride your shoes. Well. Okay, that's a bit different. On the track, you can't use overshoes for some bizarre reason, but in time trials you can, so use them. They do make a difference. Um, a friend of mine, Matt Sinclair, he uses Bont Chrono shoes, but he still uses Oversocks over them. Um, little extras, crucial. Anything that gives you an advantage, use it within legal parameters, obviously. Uh, even if it's minuscule or you just simply believe that it works for you, then use it. Why not? Um, ATS system uh, trip strips at the moment, you stick them up, they're like sticky plasters that uh, break the wind, they're little aerodynamic foils, you stick up your legs. Um, again, I refer to Sinclair, he's using it at the moment, um, and he says, you know, if it costs two or three quid per race and it gains him one second over a 25, then he's going to use it. Uh, the same idea with the little nasal plasters that open up the nose cavity, you know, get more air in. I've used them, I don't use them now, but, you know, if you believe that they work, do it. Um, for, an, for an important race like World Championships, I'd actually go around my, my pursuit bike and I would drip candle wax into the Allen key bolts so that I'd round them off and I'd smooth them off. So there were no gaps, there were no holes, everything was a very, very smooth surface. Um, you know what, yes it added a bit of weight, but to me, I knew that I was going into that World Championships 100% ready, my bike was 100% aerodynamic for me, and that made massive, massive difference psychologically, which we'll get onto in a minute. Steve? Cool. Lots of, uh, lots of people there, and I've sort of um, goes on to what we're, we're going to talk about, the visualization and whatnot, but um, just ahead on going long, uh, sort of you're looking at your 1,500 mile, 12-hour, 24-hour rides, um, you know, we've talked about the equipment, we've talked about training, you know, there's a lot of people out there obviously doing the longer events, the longer duration, um, which is a really a completely different discipline and we need a very specific approach for these kind of distances it's very important that you have a singular focus on these if you want to be at your optimal form. So, you know, you really got to focus your training, building your base, build, reducing your cardiac drift, which I explained a little bit earlier on, is, you know, really critical in this as much as, again, raising your FTP. So, you know, for those of you that are going along, making sure that you have that baseline fitness, again, as Colin said, that pyramid I'm trying to get to the top. Um, you certainly want to extend that bottom pyramid on, on uh, using, um, certainly using that to, to really boost your ability when you're starting to do them longer duration events. Nutrition strategies essential during an event. Again, what Colin had said, you know, the nutrition strategy of your pre and during event will change dramatically. Um, you know, going into something like a, 
you know, a 50 mile or certainly maybe going towards 100 mile, you're trying to consume between 60 and 80 grams of carbs per hour in it if you really want to sustain a high intensity effort. You know, so you've got to get your body used to taking them sort of uh, quantities of um, calories and nutrition while at a hard effort. So again, something you need to do while you're training and certainly doing it in, in intensive sessions. And your ability to ride in aerodynamic position for a long period of time. For anybody who's done 12 hours or 24 hours in, a, in an aerodynamic position will tell you that it's certainly not uh, that easy, certainly on your, your position, and certainly not easy to hold a good position, that whole duration. But again, if you train it, you're able to get good core strength, you're able to get uh, good posture on the bike, and you're able to maintain a good air position for the majority of that time, you're going to see benefits of your of your time, and certainly that's going to reflect your, on your performance of the day. So again, for those of you going long, I would really uh, look at making that a singular focus, certainly in the two to three months of the lead up to it. It's you know, too hard otherwise, so you really want to get the most out of your training and preparation um, towards it. Uh, we've got mental preparation, so we're looking at event visualization, Again, something that you can do during your warm-up routine. Use your warm-up routine to compose your body, relax your body, and, and get your mind focused on it. Maintaining a strategy during race uh, adverse during race adverse conditions. So, you know, whenever it's not good, whenever the, it's raining or windy, or you know, you've had a puncture, or you know you haven't felt great, or you've got mud in your eye, whatever. Again, try and keep a singular uh, focus on what you can control, a focus on your effort, on your intensity, and on your pace and strategy. And again, it's very easy to detract from that whenever things are bad. It's easy to stay focused on it whenever things are easy. But, you know, you really try and got to be as disciplined as possible whenever, um, you know, you're in adverse conditions. So you really want to make sure that you are uh, akin to, you know, keeping focused on whenever things are going bad. And I think that's the, the real true reflection of a, of a champion or certainly of a more experienced rider. Um, avoid negative external influences. Again, we're going to avoid the people that are maybe talking about, I feel bad today, it's very windy, or oh, there's not going to be good times, or you look very thin, or you look very fat, or something, nice compliments that you would get maybe before the start. Maybe some of your competitors are playing nine games, and loads of people like doing that. You know, again, control what you can control and try and avoid any sort of external negative influences. Using music, using visualization, imagery and keywords, keywords. A lot of people have got their headphones on, maybe particular music that they're listening to. They're able to to, to sort of get in the zone and that. Uh, something that again you can you can uh, practice on and uh, certainly that positive reinforcement and affirmation. Really good positive words, a really good positive environment. Maybe the people around you that are helping you with your warm up, making sure that they're positive, trying to make sure that there's a good atmosphere there atmosphere, you know, during the warm-up and the hours leading up to it can really have a good effect on your performance. Breathing and relaxation, Colin hit not uh, quite a bit in about his warm-up routine. Having that breathing, getting the air in, making sure you're you're getting your lungs filled and again settling your heart rate down whenever you're at more intensive sessions uh, and your intensive warm-up routine and that's going to reflect in your breathing whenever you're, you know, in the race. You know, so you don't want to get into a an erratic breathing uh, routine whenever you're in the race, so really trying to relax that. Goal setting, smart or smarter, probably comes down to a wee bit of your pace and strategy, looking at the focus of your effort uh, and making sure that you're hitting your goals, cutting it into chunks, as I said, in your pace and strategy as well. You know, goal setting each five, ten minutes, maybe you want to get to a certain point at a certain time, and then you get to the next point at a certain time and just looking at them as you go along. And again, post-race review, which is maybe a little bit about what Colin had said on, um, you know, your cool down as well. It's certainly something that you're able to, to look at uh, in the cool down. Colin, is there anything uh, quickly you want to say about your visualization? Very, very briefly, I know we're running over time here. Um, Steve's pretty much covered all the, all the bases there. Um, just remember, uh, you know, use, use it as training as well. You know, practice makes perfect. Consistency is the key. Um, five to ten minutes a day, little chunks, rather than one hour once a week. Um, concentrate on your positives. Once you start thinking of negatives, just stop, restart, go again. 
Um, ask yourself what you want. Focus on the target, uh, which will relate to your goal setting as well, which is smart or smarter. If you don't know what smart or smarter goal setting is, Google's your friend. Get on there. It's you know, without going into it in too much detail. It's it's um, specific, measurable, attainable, recordable, timed, evaluative, and written down. So have a quick look at that. Um, getting into the zone. Uh, avoid distractions. Be very organised. You know, a couple of days before, make sure everything is done so that there's no distractions. There's no disappointments. You reduce your external stress and your anxiety. And it just allows for the positive attention. Um, a use of keywords and mantras as well. Um, it's got to be positive. You know, you can't ride around going, "Oh God, I'm fat. Oh God, I'm fat." That's not going to work. Um, you know, think of something positive. Think of something that's going to be something you can get through your mind that is catchy that is positive and means something to you. The one thing I will go through um, is the post race review. Um, not many people do this and I try to teach all my riders, anybody, all my teammates, um, you know, try to do this. When you're on your rollers, when you're on your turbo, warming down, run through your race. Where could you have improved? What went well? What went badly? What would you do differently the next time? Are you happy with your performance? Do this while you're warming down, while it's fresh in your mind. Um, keep a journal even. Um, scribble these things down if you can't do it at that time. Just get these things down so that you can review it later on. Um, I think, quite honestly, with mental preparation, it's one of the things that made me the psychist I am. Um, very, very good at mental preparation. Uh, and you've got to keep it fun, guys and girls. Keep it fun. Steve? Okay. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, there's lots of uh, lots of great info there. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to go through some uh, some questions here that people have been coming in. There's been a lot of questions. Uh, there's, like I said, there's been a huge attendance here this evening. Um, so we're just going to go through uh, three or four, and uh, apologies if we can't get three years, but um, let's get cracking. So, okay, so uh, here's one um, common for you. Can adrenaline have a negative effect on race day? So adrenaline can, can it have a negative effect, do you believe? Yeah, I, you know, being overly hyped up um, certainly can. Um, I wouldn't want to get into the whole um, chemistry behind it, um, but through personal experience and having coached a few riders, yeah, you, you can get overhyped, uh, you can get overexcited, uh, and that will leave you feeling drained. So, yeah, it's, it's a good question to ask. Um, how, do you, how do you cope with that? It comes down to your mental preparation, first and foremost, is being organized, being focused, and being able to set yourself an achievable goal. Um, you know, even at the very, very highest levels that I've been at, um, I've never let the stress or the adrenaline get to me because I've always had the mental strength to deal with it. And the mental strength I've built over weeks and months and quite possibly years of doing the mental preparation. Okay, that's, uh, thank you very much. Um, hopefully that, that's, uh, that's helped you expand a wee bit in your knowledge on that. Um, aero bottles, where on the frame, Tom, your thoughts on aero bottles and uh, I suppose the options is uh, on the down tube or on the seat tube or behind the seat. Uh, I suppose it comes really, maybe a little bit comes down to actually the frame manufacturer, aerodynamics of it, but Colin, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, again, I think it comes down to um, the individual frame producer. Um, you know some of the um, some of the bikes now are supposed to be more aero with a bot, you know, with a bottle on or an aero bottle on. Um, I know it's quite common to see uh, some of the sort of you know ultra endurance athletes have you know a bit on between the tri bars resting on the on on the skis almost. Um, so I think it's Sintase to you know a built-in version there. Um, <laughs> It, you know, it comes down to hydration, yes, it is crucial. Um, I would 
quite honestly rather lose 10 seconds uh, through having a bottle uh, on a bike over 100 miles uh, than leaving one off or, you know, just not having one there uh, and hydrate and make sure that I can actually get my performance out than, uh, you know, just just not have a bottle. So, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'd say, um, you know, stick with the bottle, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another one is, uh, okay, so would you uh, recommend taking protein recovery powders? Is it needed worth it for after 10 or 25 mile time trials? So, I mean, protein recovery powders, I mean, well, any, any sort of recovery products uh, normally is taken, you know, after quite intensive training sessions. Uh, I, a bit like Colin, would, you know, try and recommend using as much natural food and natural products as possible without taking, you know, a lot of powders or, or certainly stuff like that. Um, you know, small bits of protein actually help the absorption of carbohydrate in the body. So after an intensive session, it's really important to get, um, to get uh, you know, carbs, the sugar in your body as quickly as possible. There's a lot of good research out there showing that, you know, small bits of, of protein uh, actually help the absorption into the bloodstream from the carbohydrate a wee bit quicker. So, you know, if I was going to take a protein recovery, I would probably maybe reduce the amount of protein that I would be taking. Okay, so you can, you can get your separate ways, adding it in with glucose, uh, compared to what you would do if you were doing a nutrition strategy for after a, you know, an 80-mile road race or a 100-mile sportive or whatever. You're obviously going to need a higher protein consumption. But you know, for after, if you are taking protein and you're looking at, you should be really looking at what you're doing next morning. Are you going training the next morning or do you have a big training block coming up? Then you want to, yes, you're looking at maybe adding a wee bit of protein, especially if you're eating, going to eat late, you're not going to eat as much whenever you get home. You know, look at all that as much as just the recovery for that particular session because, you know, realistically over 20 minutes of an effort or 25 minutes of an effort, you're not breaking down a whole lot of muscle mass. It's going to affect you greatly if you're doing nothing the next day, but if you're going to go training the next day or you're not eating right later that night, then I would have uh, maybe a reduced amount of, of protein compared to other rides in it. So, Hopefully that helps a wee bit. And uh, just one last question for you, Colin. So this gentleman here, and he's, he's turning 50 next year. And is it possible to make gain some time trials, given that uh, he's been competing in triathlon um, and only really in the last three years he's been focusing on cycling? So um, my answer would be yes. But Colin, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, give your thoughts on that. Yeah, very definitely. Um... It is. Um, don't forget that you're narrowing your sphere down. Um, you are literally taking two other sports out of the equation, and you are allowing for more recovery, not just performance, but recovery. So that swim, that run, now they're out of the equation. So you don't have to recover from that swim. You don't have to recover from that run. You're using pretty much one specific group of muscles now, one specific training technique. You're not having to train for swim, you're not having to swim, uh, you're not having to train for run. You are simply now training for a TT or training for the bike. So yes, very, very definitely. Uh, I have um, a gentleman um, who is similar age, 48, um, ex-triathlete, um, loves going to the gym. Uh, he's recently sort of given away his running, he's given away his swimming, he's cut his gym right down and his personal best time over a 10 mile time trial has gone from a 26 to a 23. Um, and that is literally in a month of simply concentrating on cycling only. So it is, uh, allow yourself a period of, um, I suppose, getting used to just doing cycling um, and allow the body to assimilate the training. But yeah, it's very, very definitely possible. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Colin. Um, that's going to wrap us up. Apologies for going a wee bit over, but hopefully you all appreciate the amount of information that we had here this evening, and everybody's able to take away, uh, you know, quite a bit, and you know, use into your own your own training. Um, for any of, the, of you that would like to to ask us about our services, certainly about a personalised coaching with ex experts such as Colin, um, please send us an email into info at digdeepcoaching.com. I would be delighted to help you. If there's any other services from our parameters 
to our nutrition services, um, please feel free to send us an email, give us a call. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We have lots and lots and lots of really good information there that we're posting every day. And, you know, feel free to contact us anytime. Thank you very much for joining us here this evening. And uh, we'll hope to see you soon at our next one. Thank you. See ya. Thanks.